dealt with, but just in a, maybe a different format or with um, different, you know, accessibility. And, and to some degree, that's true, except when it comes to the technologies. This is a new day that we find ourselves in. We are dealing with somewhat new issues and new complexities. And so I'm sympathetic to it. And, uh, and, and, and in the midst of experiencing it, you know, it was a while ago where my, um, where my son came home with, with his basketball buddies and uh, they were all staying overnight. And so when they came in the home, we just had a rule in our home where, where we would gather up all the cell phones uh, before everyone went to bed and we would kind of store the cell phones. And I, and I remember, you know, as I was doing it, I thought to myself, my parents never had to do this. Like this was not something that my parents ever did in their lives when I would come home with friends and like gather the cell phone, gather up our, our devices or our phones. And, and I was thinking to myself, why is that? Well, you know, we gather up the devices in our home for many reasons, but one of which is because we're concerned about the content that kids will bring into, uh, into our house with them that we're unaware of. And I thought, you know, when it comes to the phone, um, my parents never had an issue of wondering what the content was because they could hear me talking on the phone, right? Like we had one phone, middle of our house, they could hear me talking to, you know, whoever it was. I had a girlfriend when I was 16. They could hear that conversation. And then I thought I'd get smart. And I bought an extension cord for the telephone so that I could actually take it off of the, you know, the console or whatever we called it back then and move into another room and shut the door and talk on the phone. I thought, oh, this is so cool. I have privacy. And then what happened is my parents simply picked up another phone in the house and they could hear everything I said. And, and it wasn't just my parents who could pick up a phone and listen to everything I said. We, we grew up in the prairies. And so in our environment, anyone who lived within about two or three miles could pick up their phone and listen to everything we said because we had this funny thing called party line. I think it was, the, it was actually the very beginning of, of social, social media platforms. It was very social. Everyone could listen in. And we were always telling our neighbors to hang up the phone and quit listening in on us. So our, our world was so different then than it is now. And it's understandable uh, for us to feel somewhat like out of control within this space and wondering, oh man, how, how should we function in this space? How should we help our kids live in this space so that they can actually experience what it is to be flourishing as human beings? And that's really what we're looking for. Like, how can we, how can we live in this space with these devices in a way that can actually, actually result in a health way of being and a healthy way of living. I'm going to share my screen real quickly because I want to share a few thoughts with you just when we think about how do we live well in this space. And there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of, I would call them like life preservers that keep me from drowning when I'm thinking about how to live really well in the space that we're in now. And, and just to be really clear, I'm coming at this conversation from a faith position, from from someone who has a deep belief in God and his son, Jesus Christ, and the reality that he is ultimately over all things. And he actually has a way for us to live in a healthy manner within the space that he's put us. So here's three kind of um, lifesavers that are, have always been important to me, uh, even when I'm in the midst of this. Number one is that God is in control. And so when you take a look in Acts chapter 17, uh, especially near the end, it talks about this idea that he himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need from one man. He created all beings, um, uh, uh, create all nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should arise and fall and he determined their boundaries. So it just makes me go again, oh, okay, even though I often feel out of control, I have a God who is not out of control. And I love that reality. Um, the second thing that's really important for me is remembering that this God who is in control is actually for us. He's not against us. So Romans 8, 31 to 32 says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And it's a rhetorical question. He's, what he's doing is he's saying, hey, if God is for us, um, is there anyone that can actually keep us from doing or living in the way that God would have us to be? Like there's always a way forward. And then I love the logic. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And, and what he's saying is he's saying, hey, listen, he willingly gave up his son for us. And there's nothing more precious to the father than his son. Do you think he's actually not going to give us what we need now? Because anything else we need now is infinitely small compared to his son. So of course, he's going to continue to give us what we need to live faithfully in the space that he's called us to. So I, I just, I'm always moving back to that. And then number three, the reality that God's actually called us to this time. So in John 17, he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, 
but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of the world, even as I'm not of it. Um, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. And I think, you, you know, Rachel, as, I'm, as I've been thinking a lot about this, I, I, I often think, oh man, I'd love to go back to the good old days. You know, I think we, we think that way, but the reality is there is no such thing as the good old days. For those of us who have grown up within church environments, we know that ever since Genesis chapter three, when sin first entered the world, we have lived in a broken reality. That's just true. And we are broken within. We experience brokenness without. This is true. Sin's in the world. And there's no such thing as quote unquote, the good old days. What there is is the days that God has given us and the hope of what is yet to come. But the reality is he has called us to a time such as this. We wouldn't be here if God didn't want us to be here. And so I rest in that. And the other thing that's really been fascinating for me, and I'm talking about this with students more and more, um, and I'm realizing this, that while for me living in this space that we're in now, uh, it takes me a lot of work to think through, oh man, how should I function here? How do I need to respond? What do I need to do? But the reality is that God's way of living in this space right now, I think will come more naturally and in more innovative ways to the next generation, because this is really the only type of space they've ever known. So even, you know, when we're looking at youth ministries and the results of COVID in terms of removing the systems and structures that we've been so used to for so long, and now, you know, in youth ministry, we're having to recreate new systems or structures or ways of being that can facilitate our mission and purpose. There is an element where it's daunting for everyone, but there's a generation where it's much less daunting for than it is for like my generation and older, because this is kind of the soup they have lived in. And I just think God's calling them to um, all sorts of wonderful, innovative kingdom ways, ways of bringing flourishing to others that don't come natural to, natural to me. And what I really feel my job is to continue to help develop their character and give them a vision of what God would have for them in terms of how to live their lives. And they'll figure out how to use these tools in ways that are wonderfully what I would call redemptive in ways that I haven't even thought of before. So I think there's lots of hope for us when we think about you know, the next generation living in this space that God's called us to. Okay, in light of that, let me just really quickly give you just a couple of just ideas of research. Again, we don't wanna spend much time here because we all intuitively know this, but on any given day, American teenagers, 13 to 18 years old, average about nine hours of entertainment media use per day, excluding time spent at school and homework. Tweens, by the way, use an average of about six hours or so worth of entertainment media daily. So we're immersed in it. And, and just to be clear, when, when, and this comes from common sense media, when they think about these types of stats, it's not like um, it's nine hours of content and that could be stringed together. Like when you string it together, it would come to nine hours, but it could be like multiple uh, platforms played at the same time. So listening to music while watching uh, something on Netflix, while FaceTiming my friends, and you'd add that all up and that would be the number of hours that you're looking at. Um, by age 11, a majority of kids have their own smartphone, uh, more than two thirds, 69%. Uh, among 16 to 18 year olds who use social media, the median age is about 14, 28% started before 13, 43% at 13, 30% not until they were 15 or older. From 2015 to 2019, the proportion of teens who use social media every day has gone from 45% to 63%. So we continue to see that moving up and we're not going to, that's not going to change anytime, anytime soon. Um, interesting. Uh, difference in terms of how boys use types of social media, or, or sorry, I would classify in our research that we're doing, we actually classify video games as a type of social media. It's the one, it's a platform that boys use more than young ladies. And it's obvious 70% of boys age 8 to 18 say they enjoy playing video games a lot. 23% of girls age 8 to 18 say they enjoy playing video games a lot. And then 50% of all girls say they enjoy using social media a lot. So that would be like Snapchat, Instagram, uh, not as many on Facebook as those of us who are older. By the way, really interesting, in about 2011, there was a mass exodus of teenagers from Facebook. And they asked the question, why was that? And it was because parents came onto the platform, so the kids were out. So if you'd like to get your kids to stop using like TikTok, just start posting awkward videos of yourself using TikTok. Sure enough, they're going to be off there real quick. It's a great way to move them on. 50% uh, of girls say they enjoy using social media a lot. 32% of boys say they enjoy using social media a lot. Um, in 2019, the video game industry made over $150 billion. Comparatively, the music movie industry made just $42.5 And so this is one of the fastest growing 
areas of the entertainment industry is the video games. Uh, people now watch about a billion hours of YouTube videos every single day. The average person watches 40 minutes of YouTube content and there are 800, just speaking again of engaging in these platforms, there are 800 million monthly active users on Instagram. And still, even though we'd like to suggest that Facebook was so like 2015, it adds 500,000 new users every day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so we continue to see these platforms populate and continue to move forward. Um, what should concern us? Let me give us, I mean, we all have a bunch of concerns, of course. Let me just share with you a few concerns that I'm seeing kind of consistently out there. And then what I'll do is I'll give you some ideas in response and then we'll start answering some of the questions that have come in. So what should concern us? Number one, of course, and I think that this is a pretty common concern for all of us is the access to inappropriate content. We're, we're concerned about what is coming into our environments and into our spaces. Um, I have a 19 year old boy and a 16 year old boy. Right now, both are living um, in our home. And we talk a lot about, about the types of content that are coming into our home and how we should be responding to that. And so we should be concerned about that. And of course, um, you know, our, one of our great concerns is the issue of pornography. And we continue to see uh, uh, use of pornography grow at an alarming rate. Um, really interesting, most of the stats that you see on use around pornography are conservative in nature. And, and I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I'm wary of stats and we do a lot of research work ourselves, so I understand it. One of the reasons I'm a little bit wary of stats is because we can often shape the narrative of what we find in our research to support an agenda that we may have. So it's, you can do that. And even when it comes to issues of pornography, we can, we can kind of skew the facts a little bit to again, support our agenda. Here's what we know about stats on pornography in general, that they're pretty conservative and they are so for two reasons. Number one, many of the stats, not all of them, but many of the stats that we read on pornography are older. So that's really fascinating. And that is continuing change on a regular basis, especially since we entered COVID, we saw an uptick of people accessing inappropriate content online quickly. And so it's, it's hard to keep up with that. And number two, one of the reasons why many of our stats around porn are conservative is because people generally don't like to disclose um, how they're actually accessing content that they may not be proud of. That's shame-based in nature. And so there's usually a fairly conservative nature to what's taking place. Um, just for an example, oftentimes you'll read stats on the average age of first encounter with pornography, and we'll say it's around 11 or 12. That stat was actually pre-2005, before the advent of the smartphone. We would say now that the average age of engagement with pornography, I would suggest is somewhere around eight or nine years of age. That would be you know, kind of average age of first encounter. When I talk with kids, that's the kind of timeline when many kids would, would tell me about that. The other concern, by the way, that's happening when it comes to content and pornography in particular, is that for many years we've shaped the conversation as it being primarily a male issue but really what we're seeing now is um more and more females are engaging in pornography than what we assume to be the case uh, many years ago in fact when i speak to the issue of pornography at a conference or retreat um over the last couple of years i've had more young ladies come and talk to me about their struggle with pornography than I do young boys. And so this is a human, uh, this is a human being issue that we're talking about here. So one of the current, well, one of the concerns we have, of course, is access to inappropriate content. By the way, the other concern, and we know this, especially with the way politics are moving now, is when we talk about inappropriate content is access to false content or misleading content. That's not true. And so, you know, one of the things that I'll talk about really quickly one of the great gifts that we can give to our kids are good critical thinking skills or good discernment skills. And not simply in terms of what is a right message or a wrong message, but also what is an accurate message and what is an inaccurate message. And so we continue to teach them to be observing about the source of the content, how it measures up to other sources that are speaking to the content, what kind of an agenda someone delivering the content may have, how they might angle the conversation. Those are all types of things that we, you know, conversations that we enter into with our kids as a way of teaching them good critical thinking and discernment skills early on. And we'll speak a little bit more about that as we go. 
Uh, number two, engagement with inappropriate posting. And so one of our, you know, one of our great concerns is what our kids are posting online. And again, you know, because again, when it comes to things such as pornography, we're starting at a very young age with kids, helping them understand what's appropriate, what's not appropriate to be posting online. We talk a lot about things like, hey, we never post anything online without clothes on. We're really careful about that, about certain spaces that we're in. You know, we talk about, uh, talk about some of those obvious things when it comes to posting. Uh, you, you know, it's very interesting. I was talking with, um, with a, a group of youth workers and, and one of my friends who is a camp worker had mentioned to me that um, his daughter had been asked if she would post a naked picture of herself or text a naked picture of herself to some of the other boys in their classroom. And it was really interesting when you think about how um, engagement in contests is shaping the different genders, a, another young girl who was with her turned to her and simply said, why won't any of the boys ask me for my naked picture? And so all of a sudden there became value and status connected to this type of request that were taking place. And so it's shaping the way that our kids see ourselves and the way that they express themselves. So real concerns there. The other thing just to say when it comes to inappropriate posting is not just the overt ways of inappropriate posting, but also what's taking place in the psyche of our kids when they post. So, you know, one of the conversations we started having with our kids when they were really young was why are you posting what you're posting? So they wanted to post pictures of things they bought, things they were doing. And I would say to them, hey, why are you posting that? Are you posting that so that other people will think more of you? Are you posting that as a way of celebrating something really good and fun? Are you posting that to include others? Uh, you know, what would be the reason behind why you're posting? And of course, you know, we're thinking a lot uh, when we're doing that, what we're thinking about is identity formation, what shapes them, the need of affirmation of others, where they find their security, and how, you know, how they're using these spaces to serve others rather than serve themselves or their own self-esteem. And so there's, a, there's some complexity even there in terms of the conversations we started having at an early age with our boys. Uh, number three is disengagement from life beyond the screen. And so that concerns me when we spend uh, time there and, and we leave behind some of the other things that we know are really important and valuable. You know, when we entered COVID, one of the things that we did as a family is we just stated what were our top values or priorities as a family. And so we knew spending family time together was a top priority, being physically active was a top priority, um, serving others was a top priority for us. And then, you know, doing our homework uh, was a top priority for us. And, and then entertainment was down below that. And so then what we would do is we would just evaluate, you know, when we would work through our days, we would say, okay, how much time did we place in these categories compared to how much time did we do in other areas? And so we started trying to work as a family to define what our family values were and then discern if our actual values were aligned with the values that we wanted to be defining for our home. And so that just created really good conversation for us as well, even thinking through what's important to us. Um, uh, number four, unhealthy relational interactions, of course, are a concern online. And I think we're concerned certainly about issues of bullying, uh, issues of predators, but we're also concerned about, um, about the uh, social pressure that kids feel when they think about curating what they're posting as a way to continue to garnish attention. And so, um, you, you know, it, it, it's really interesting how kids understand community. You know, before the industrial age, community was primarily defined by your location, where you were and where you grew up. People couldn't travel or move. That was your community and you remained committed to each other because you could never leave each other. And then post-industrial revolution, when people began to travel more, community was defined primarily by where you gathered. And so, you know, we created churches or sports teams and it would attract people to them. And when they came, that became the community. And, and now what we see with, with kids is that community is becoming defined by what they can gather online. And, um, and the danger with this type of community is that the kids feel all the pressure to maintain the community. So they have to create content that actually attracts people. They need to feel, they feel the pressure of continuing to create unique content that keeps people engaged. They feel the pressure of curating who can actually engage their online community for fear of allowing someone in. 
that others will see as undesirable and leave that type of space and they feel the pressure to continue to build that community. And so all of a sudden there's all this pressure for them to be able to gather, maintain and hold community. And, and here's what's really wonderful. Um, uh, this is why I love youth ministries so much because you know God has called us to a type of community that the Greek word would be koinonia where, where there's an unconditional nature to the community. We're committed to each other because we've experienced what it is for God to invite us into his community. And so we are inviting to others and we wanna face into each other and engage each other in deep ways and journey together. And so what I love about youth ministries is when we create unique and wonderful ways to unconditionally engage others in community and invite them in. So I, I just think there's so many wonderful things that we get to do in terms of our community that we're involved in. Um, number five, of course, is an ep epidemic rise is anxiety and mental health issues. If I'm not mistaken, for those of you who were here last week, Rachel, you talked a little bit about that. And we know that there are all sorts of things contributing to um, mental health issues amongst adolescents, but there is plenty of research that's suggesting that in, you know, unhealthy engagement in our social media platforms are a significant contributing factor. Um, there's a, a, a sociologist out of University of San Diego. Uh, her name is Dr. Jean Twangy. I would really recommend her book called iGen. She does a lot of work on generations and she's taken a look at this, you know, current adolescent generation that was born in the late 90s. Upper age is about 23. Do you know what I mean? Lower age is, is at the tween or teenager um, uh, entry point. And, and here's what she says in the research that she's done. And there's, there's some people pushing back on it, but it's pretty solid, pretty widely accepted research. And what she found was that from 2010 to 2016, adolescents who experienced at least one major depressive episode um, increased by 60%. Um, a recent study found that kids who spent three hours or more a day on smartphones were 34% more likely to experience at least one suicide related outcome. So a sense of hopelessness, no reason to go on, no hope for the future uh, than kids who spent uh, two hours a day or less. And this has been an interesting stat uh, that that amount of time spent on social media platforms seem to have a significant contribution to where kids are at in terms of how they would understand their own mental health. Um, the other thing, by the way, that they found uh, and there's a great book called The Coddling of the American Mind that I would highly recommend. And it talks about developing emotional and relational resilience in young people and what's contributing to a lack of resilience. What they found was that kids who were engaged in physical activities or religious gatherings uh, were significantly more healthy than kids who were not. And, and they could actually handle more time online than kids who weren't engaged in those other types of activities. And so there was balancing elements to the experience that kids were having when it came to their engagement online. And, um, and so we see that. There's a few possible contributing factors when we think about the mental health and what's happening with young people and social media. Uh, number one is an unrealistic expectation of reality. So what happens is many people post online in a way that curates the negative elements of their experience and only brings forth the best possible situations they could find themselves in. And suddenly others think about that as the normative way of being that they can't measure up to. And so that becomes problematic. Number two is the vulnerability to unhealthy relationships. We've talked about that. And you know, the, 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 the interesting thing about unhealthy relationships is of course, when I was growing up and I experienced unhealthy relational interactions at school, when I left the school at 3.30, I left those unhealthy relationships. But of course, for many of, ki of our kids, those relationships stay with them in their pocket on their phone and the unhealthy nature actually can grow even though they're physically removed from the situation. Um, a fear of missing out. Um, number four is the loss of time spent in face-to-face -face relationships. The research tells us that the more time kids can spend in relational proximity or physical proximity with others, the greater their health and the more time they spend being physically active, the greater uh, their health may be, which by the way, is a great case for encouraging your kids to be involved in camp. Now, I have a little bit of an agenda there. My wife is the executive director of Green Bay Bible Camp. And we love, uh, we think, you know, camp is great for campers and kids who get to come to camp for a week, but camp is transformative for our high school students and young adults who are on staff at camp, where they actually get to set aside some of these distractions. They're physically engaged and they're involved in significant um, 
spiritual and, and responsible work in the lives of others. And, and it can be really powerful for them. So we love that. Uh, number five, less time being physically active. And then number six, a loss of quality of sleep. Um, by the way, it was just yesterday again, where we had the conversation with my oldest son about leaving his phone outside of his room at night. And, and here's what's interesting. You know, we found as our kids moved towards adulthood, our um, influence had to shift a little bit away from rules and more towards relationships. You know what I mean? And, and so as your kids move towards um, um, owning their own journey more and more, if we want to continue to influence, that transition needs to happen. But even within the context of relational engagement, we're talking about some of these really practical ways of dealing with our devices. And so as a family, you know, we'll go through seasons where my wife and I will say, hey, for the next week, let's just leave our phone out of our bedroom. Let's see how that changes the way we interact with each other. Let's see what that does to our sleep patterns and our own personal health. And then we talk about that as family as well. And so these are conversations we're continuing to have in our home. Okay. In light of that, then really quickly, let me give you a couple of ideas of how I think we should respond generally, and then we can answer some of the questions in a much more uh, uh, practical or in-depth way. So number one, we need to model healthy habits of living with technology as adults in our home. And, and you know, uh, one of the things that our research has told us over and over again, that when it comes to passing values onto the next generation, what we model is more powerful than what we simply teach. Or maybe what I would say is that uh, what is caught is more powerful than what is verbally taught. And so um, our kids are watching us, they observe us, they understand the culture of our homes and that culture of our home becomes them. And so, um, you know, when we model healthy habits of living, it's easier for our students to embrace those healthy habits of living. So what Jen and I are finding ourselves doing is before we talk with our kids, when it comes to issues of technology, we're simply talking with each other and we're going, oh, okay, like is what we're asking of our kids, does it have integrity behind it? And, and just to be clear, um, it could be age appropriate activity. So I'll give you an example of that. Uh, when we would talk, um, one of the things that we did in our home is we all share the same Netflix account. Well, as far as I know, my kids may have created secret accounts. That's a real possibility, <laughs> but I haven't. <laughs> and we've invited them onto our accounts. And so what's been great, you know, one of the good things about that is it leads to lots of conversations around what's appropriate or not appropriate to watch. And so sometimes I'll say to my boys, hey boys, there's a couple of videos that um, are unfinished and your dad turned them off because they were actually really inappropriate. And I just wanted to make you aware of that. And I remember when my son, when I was first talking with my son about that, he said to me, he goes, hey, dad, I know I started one of those videos and you always turn them off right in the middle of the bad part. Could you fast forward to the end? So if we accidentally turn one on, we're not in the bad part. And I'm like, oh yeah, let me help you out with that. So, you know, that just helps us as a, you know, and then sometimes I'll say to the boys, I'll say, hey boys, there's a movie that I watched on Netflix. You'll see that. I'll say the message is a really great message, but I don't think it's appropriate for you to watch yet. So when it came to Schindler's List or Saving Private Ryan, I really felt like those were movies that had really powerful and important messages, but it wasn't until my boys were older where I felt it was appropriate for them to be watching those. And those were the types of conversations that we would have uh, that allowed us to model a way of living with some of our technologies. Uh, number two, uh, create and recreate boundaries and tech-free zones for your family. And I think it's really great for us to have spaces like that. Like for instance, the first hour when you get home from school, all your tech can end up in a container. Um, when you go to bed at night, you know, or an hour before it's bedtime, let's make sure all tech comes off and there's other healthy activities that we can be involved in. Around meal times, we fight to leave tech off our tables um, and untouchable. And so, you know, what we're saying is there are things more important in life than simply what's on our devices. And we acknowledge there's very important things on our devices. We love those things, but there are certain times and spaces where, where we wanna make sure those are set aside. So I think it's great for us to, to do that. And what we have found in our family is we would create boundaries and then we'd break right through them and we'd have to recreate them. And I just, I have no problem with that. I would just say to our boys, boys, here's what we're rolling with right now. That may change or we might break them, but then we'll start again. And so that just became habits for us. And by the way, it reminds me a little bit about grace. You know, grace is renewed and experienced new every day. And so we just kept leaning into that reality as well. Uh, number three, 
I think it's great to delay smartphone and social media use. I think that's really healthy. I think there's a number of reasons for it, why I think delaying use is, is really good. Um, one of my concerns is, the, is identity formation and that I think it's really important for our young people to have their identity rooted in healthy relational experiences. First and foremost, of course, in terms of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Secondly, in terms of the family unit that they're a part of. And so I really, uh, I, I think that there's something healthy about delaying that time when they get into their social media because that becomes space where other people start to define identity for young people and it can be really difficult in that space and so if there is some rootedness to them before they get there they're much better able to um, use that space in really redemptive ways and not be reformed by that space so there's a strength of character that can happen when it comes to delaying that use and, and i think there's there's health there the other thing i want to say however i want to be careful that we don't demonize our technology or social media either we acknowledge the problems and difficulties but we also acknowledge the redemptive ways that we can use these devices and these platforms and again we teach our kids good discernment like we would in all other areas of faith and life so that they can respond well in whatever space they find themselves in. Uh, number four, uh, teach discernment early. I think that we need to fight to start teaching our kids discernment really early. Um, we started with our kids when they were very young. We created three basic categories that we worked with, especially when it came to content. And we were talking about music at the beginning. So we talked about poison, popcorn, and protein. And we said to our kids, hey, there are some things in life that are just like poison. They're never good for you. So we should never listen to those things. So we would talk about lyrics from songs or messages and movies. And we would say, hey, do you think that's something that's helpful and good for human beings? That, is that a way that God would have us be? No, nope, that's poison. Let's not touch that. And then there are some things we would say are popcorn. They're, they're kind of not good or bad. They just are. That's fine. And it's fun to play with that. When our boys first started listening to One Direction, which was a difficult moment for me, I came to a place where I said, okay, that's primarily popcorn right now. All right. Let's, you know, but the problem is if you only eat popcorn, it's going to make you sick. And I got sick really fast. So we kind of removed that popcorn quickly. And, and then we said, there's protein and this is stuff that's just good for us. The messages are good. The, the themes are good and we celebrate these things. And, and sometimes with our boys, we would go, hey, you guys, this week, let's just do protein. So we're not gonna touch the popcorn. We're just gonna do protein for a week. Let's give that a go. And those became categories we worked in. Now there is a problem when you start teaching your kids discernment at a young age, they start becoming discerning about a lot of things. So sometimes in our church, I gotta be honest with you, the music on the stage, like the, um, the structure of it or the, uh, you know, wasn't exactly protein to our ears. And so they would be like, dad, I don't think that person has the gift of singing. I'm not, I, maybe they should do something else. And I was like, yeah, you might be right about that. So we became discerning about a lot of different things. Um, number five, clarify family values. I think it's great to sit down as a family and talk about the things that are most important to you. Um, again, we did this in COVID. We said, hey, you guys, what are the things that are most important to us as family? Okay, let's think through our days. How are we ordering our time in light of these things that we say are most important? And then where are we putting, you know, how much time are we putting into things that don't line up with our family values? And we had lots of great conversations. I mean, sometimes we would say friends and community are really important. And then our boys would say, well, dad, uh, you know, when we're playing our video games like NBA 2K, that's where I spend a lot of time with my community. And I couldn't argue with that. We'd have great conversations around that. And then that would lead us into conversations around content. Well, what kind of games that you're playing with community are good content? What's negative content? Or around the effects of spending too much time in front of screens. So now you understand that we had like multiple layers in the conversation when it came to discernment, but we acknowledged all those different layers. By the way, um, one thing that was really important to us, I remember when our boys were young and we didn't allow them to play first person shooter games. Uh, we got rid of Call of Duty and it was, it was really hard for my oldest son. And, and it invited a really strong emotional response. And it took me a while to understand what he was responding to. And the issue was not so much that he couldn't play a video game, but that it removed him from the social circle of the other kids who were playing the video game. And so we realized that we were removing something unintentionally that was really important to them and important value of our family 
And so we had to actively think through ways that we could engage that value in ways that we saw as healthy. So in our home, we ended up building a half pipe <laughs> in our front yard. So our boys could invite their friends and kids were like, oh man, I go play Call of Duty, but I get to ride the half pipe, let's do that. And so we just discovered other ways to engage those values in a healthy manner and replace what we'd unintentionally removed when we removed the video games. Um, number six, talk a lot about identity, hybrid living, how you live online and how you live offline. We had lots of those conversations. Who you are online should be the same as who you are offline. And by the way, one of the things we did was we moved our video game consoles into public spaces in our home so that we could be aware of how our kids were interacting online. And I would go to my boys and go, hey, what did you just say to those other boys? And they go, oh, dad, that's just gamer talk. I said, oh, no, no, in our home, there's no such thing as gamer talk. There's ways that human beings should talk to other human beings, and there's ways that we shouldn't. And it doesn't matter where we are, whether we're on video games or on our phones or in person, there's a way that God would have us address other people that's respectful and offers dignity. And so we spoke about those ideas a lot. Um, number seven, put safeguards in place. I think that's helpful. I, I do want to be clear. There's no such thing as safe proofing your home or your kid's experience. Um, we live in a world that is broken and there's access to inappropriate material all over the place. That's true. I'll be honest with you that when it came to dealing with access to inappropriate content, our goal was to prepare our kids for when exposure happened, not if exposure would happen. And so we worked a lot at giving them a plan on how to respond when inappropriate exposure took place. So we want to put good safeguards in place. We want to protect our kids, but we also acknowledge that we're not just trying to protect them. We're also trying to prepare them to respond in healthy ways when exposure does happen. Um, number eight, invest in great shared experiences and activities with your children. I think that's really important. Shared experiences develop community, which allow for conversation. And, um, and ultimately, conversation wins the day. And so we would think a lot about what are healthy shared experiences and activities that we can do together as a family that continues to give us a sense of identity as a home and give our kids a sense of belonging in a really important space. Uh, finally, remember relationships win. So we're always shooting for relationships. And then where appropriate, engage with your kids in their digital world. I wanna say a couple things about that. Uh, number one, I think that there's good space online with our kids to interact with them. I think especially with our boys, not exclusively with boys, but there may be space where we game together and we would do that with our boys. I remember when we Sport first came out and as a family, we would have tennis tournaments and do things like that. And um, I talked with other parents who ended up playing, you know, um, uh, other games with their kids. It became too complex for me, so I was out and my boys understood that, but we would do other things together. Um, we found that engaging appropriately in social media together became, became quite powerful. There's a, there's, a, there's a type of conversation that, that we call phatic communion or a way of engaging. And phatic communion describes um, ties of union that can be created by exchanges that appear to be meaningless. So, you know, uh, whether it's a little a gif or whether it's a funny text, that sometimes those small things can help others feel like they are a significant, have a significant place in your thinking or way of being. So I actually encourage uh, parents to, to text with their kids. I think that's actually a really helpful and healthy thing to do, especially as they get a little bit older. I'll be honest, um, with my oldest son, there was a time where he found it difficult to disclose to me different things that were happening in his life in face-to-face -face relationships but for some unknown reason, he felt safe to do it texting. And so for a, for a couple of years, we would text on issues. And then, you know, as trust was built, I was able to start taking those conversations into physical space with him and the relationship just built from there. But really he found it somewhat safe to disclose online with me through texting. We were like, okay, let's try that. And then we'll continue to move the conversation forward. And so we found that actually in our home to be something that's been really good and helpful. We do group text together as family and, and do jokes and things like that. And again, when we send those small things through the day, those small words actually have more power than we think. They give a sense of connectedness, they're personal, and they say to those involved that you belong to me and I belong to you. I'm thinking about you even through the day. 
So I think there can be great value in some of those experiences. Now, just to be clear, our boys set some boundaries when it came to their social media accounts. We were allowed to follow them, but we were not allowed to comment on anything their friends posted or on anything they posted. So we tried to honor that as best we could because we thought it was a real privilege to be allowed into at least this small space of their world that they had online in that time. Okay, hey, whew, that's some information. We just, we just blasted you with a water hose of information. And uh, what I wanna do is just take a pause here and then Rachel, I think I'm gonna jump out of this screen and then um, we can move to any, uh, any questions that we have and start to answer some of those questions specifically. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Sid. That was wonderful. So much information. Um, I love that you brought up uh, grace, that we can have grace with ourselves for, for messing up or maybe for not thinking about things like, oh my goodness, like all my kids, they're all sitting there on the couch, like we're failing. <laughs> every day is a new day. His mercies are new every morning. So. Uh, to have some grace oh. with yourself, right? When, when things are not going as they should. Yeah, and you know what, Rachel? One of the things that we, that we became committed to pretty early on was the practice of saying sorry to our kids, which, which just to be really clear, um, didn't come easy because we would be involved in an experience together. We would have elevated. I would have responded in a way that I didn't appreciate. And really, my son shouldn't have responded the way he did, but but I had to humble myself and go and just apologize, own what I needed to own and trust that God would do his work in his art. And of course we dealt with discipline, but one of the things that actually came of that as difficult as it was, is our kids began to experience what it was to say sorry quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that became a, ha again, for me, as I look back, I was like, why do my boys come and say sorry as quick as they do? And I realized, well, their mom and, you know, fought to model that actually in our lives with them. And as hard as that was, it was a way of, of, of expressing the kingdom way and they embracing that. So I think saying sorry to our kids is really important. And then also again, like Rachel, just acknowledging like ultimately God's got this and mm -hmm. we're journeying and we make mistakes, but nothing is beyond his redemptive touch. Like there is nothing beyond mm -hmm. his redemptive touch or, or ability to transform. Even, you know, one of the great fears, I think as I've talked with parents and we ourselves had was again, um, exposure to unhealthy content and a great fear, like what will happen to my child, their future mm -hmm. relationships, the way they see other human beings and just realizing again, oh, there's nothing that God can't redeem, restore, recreate. This is what he does. And so what that did is it saved me from fear-based parenting, mm -hmm. which rarely results in, um, in healthy transformation. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. I was able to move from fear-based to more grace-based with a hopeful disposition of what could be. And, and what happened is, is as our boys grew older, it shifted from being primarily confrontational to becoming more invitational. Oh, there's mm -hmm. a better way that we're called to. And, and so that's really important to remember. I love that you brought that up. Yeah, absolutely. So someone is wondering at the beginning of, of your talk, you mentioned that you collect kids phones is that something that you did when they were a certain age do you still do that would you recommend doing that like, yeah I absolutely about? recommend it yeah Rachel I think it's great and here's what we actually found we found that parents actually appreciated that when kids would come to our home um, and and whether parents of faith or non-faith we just said hey you guys in our home um, after a certain time so you know whether that's 9 p.m or 10 p.m we just said we're gonna collect we're gonna collect um, all their phones and their, you know, their, their, their devices that they have. And then we would make sure all the parents knew our phone number. So if they needed their kids, they could access us. Absolutely. And uh, vice versa for, for kids as well. Now, as they got older, we began to relax that a little bit, but when rules were broken, then we re-engaged. So we had a situation just this summer with a number of 16 year old boys that were over and, um, and, and we busted them and we said, okay, guys, Hey, we love you. We want you here. But obviously we can't, you know, you've lost the right to be able to have this freedom. You're not being responsible mm -hmm. with this freedom. And so we brought that back. Um, here's, what we, here's what we found again. Like, you know, we have a 19 year old living at home again. And, and, and you heard me say it before that our authority shifted from rules to relationship as they got older. And mm -hmm. part of that is the journey of differentiation as our kids move into space where their identity becomes their own, their faith needs to become their own. And so they start to push away a little bit from the family of origin in terms of practices perhaps, right. or they test new values or ways of thinking, and they have to have some space to make their own decisions. 
And so, um, you know, we have home rules. Hey, if you're in our home, these are rules we will abide by. Your mm -hmm. beliefs, you're going to have to work that out. But these are practices that are important to us. But we're going to give you more freedom within our home. You have to make more decisions. But especially when your decisions start affecting others within the home, then we're going to change some of the rules. So, um, again, you know, with our 19-year-old, um, uh, just the other day, he was wrestling through some things. And I just sat with him. I said, hey, buddy, like, you know, you have the right to take your phone into your room. But I don't think it's resulting in healthy practices for you. You're not sleeping. You know, it's really mm -hmm. important. I would encourage you to move your phone into the, into the kitchen at night and, and mom and dad are going to work on that as well. And so I didn't force that on him. He's an adult. We give him that kind of freedom. We hope we've laid good foundation, mm -hmm. but because we fought to maintain relationship that had influence mm -hmm. and sure enough, you know, we're making these mm -hmm. kinds of decisions together mm -hmm. as family. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm kind of walking that boundary myself a little bit. And, and as someone else also asked, is there an age kind of where, where the kids are transitioning into an into adulthood where they're supposed to be taking a little bit more responsibility for their technology or you would hope that that would be the outcome is there sort of an age for that or is it kind of up each child is unique uh, what would you yeah say? that that's a great question and i do think there's 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 a uniqueness that um it's it's really hard to suggest one size fits all on that conversation that's certainly what we found in our home in fact, both of our boys responded to their digital spaces differently. Um, and I'm not sure what were all the contributing elements. Uh, one of our children uh, seemed to excel in more physical activity. And so they had a sense of identity there that was actually stronger and grounded. Our other child um, struggled in some of the physical activities, but he found online that, that he was proficient at different things. And so then there was a greater pull in that space. And so we had to really wrestle through, excuse me, sorry, what our boundaries were, mm. what our kids were experiencing in that, and the way that they experienced their digital world was different as well, which in some cases created greater concern, in some cases created less. And so we had some different rules for the boys at different times in their life. And we just, we explained that to them and we talked about it and, and helped them see that. I found that as they got older, so once they started moving through middle school, um, we would allow them to test the waters. So, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to open this up. You have some decisions to make. And again, if they could handle those freedoms responsibly, we celebrated that. We continued to move to the next, to the next. But when it became destructive or self-destructive for them or others, then we had to pull back on that again. And so mm -hmm. we just found that type of journeying happening. Now, again, with our 19-year-old in our home, we certainly have certain home rules, but he's an adult. And mm -hmm. we honor that about him. And so when we see things of concern, it's actually an issue of relationship. So we have relational conversations more than it is about engaging rules. And, right. and here's a point again, rules without relationship almost always result in rebellion. Mm -hmm. And so we just kept that in mind as we worked with our kids. That's great advice. Someone has a question about YouTube channels and they have a tween or maybe early teens. When is it okay or is it okay for them to have a YouTube channel, start posting content, um, it could be, you know, obviously with parameters, but even simple scenarios such as look at me riding my bike. What, what would you recommend yeah. about YouTube channels? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, um, what's our concern with posting things online? There's a few things that we're, that I'm concerned about, sorry, that I'm concerned about when it comes to posting, I'm concerned about, you know, basic safety issues, like, you know, giving a, uh, uh, personal or private information and placing it out there in a way that it can be accessed by people that I don't know or don't trust. So, you know, closed environments. If my kids are posting on closed environments, um, I feel better about that, especially when I know the other people that are involved in that closed environment. And in youth ministries right now, you know, we're talking a lot about what kind of platforms are appropriate for youth ministries to be using. And in particular, closed environments that, ha that are only able to be accessed by certain people within the group context. Of course, we find that to be um, much more safe. So I'm, I'm aware of that. Number two, I'm thinking in terms of why are we posting? And so again, we talk about that a lot. And it's great to celebrate activities and accomplishments with others. But what are we looking for in others' responses? And are we looking for something from their responses? And so, you know, when we talk about teaching discernment, we talk about, hey, how does it make you feel when someone responds this way? Mm -hmm. Or, or what are, you know, what does that mean to you? Or what, what do you, how would you like people to respond? Why? What happens when they don't? So we talk a lot about those kinds of issues. So that, you know, that is concerning to me. At the same time, 
It's a wonderful environment to engage in creativity, group sharing, interaction. And so there's lots of um, good social skills that can be acquired in that space as well. Now, I would say a couple of things when it comes to posting and devices. Up to a certain age, I think that the kind of language we should use is this is our. So this is our YouTube mm. channel. This is our cell phone. This is our device. And what that does is it allows us to be more open to accountabilities and um, parental control and guidance. So because it's our phone, it only makes sense that I would also use it and see what's being placed on it or what kinds of interactions are happening. Because it's our account, it only makes sense that I would be aware of what you're posting and what other people are saying or responding to. Do you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. we would, I, I think that's really helpful. The other thing that we did in our home, and I'm just, I'm extrapolating a little bit right now, is we made transparency with devices just part of our culture or our value or ethos. It just the way it is that we would have access to one another's devices. Now, that didn't mean that kids could access my device freely, but they knew that mom had free access to my device. They saw that. So because of work and business, there's things that aren't healthy or appropriate for my kids to see or access, but they knew that there was a principle of vulnerability and openness and therefore it didn't feel, um, it, it didn't feel like an act of control or mm -hmm. abuse for me to ask for access to their device or their platform. That was simply the way that we wanted to live without fear of people knowing something about us or, or having to live in a hidden way. Now, again, um, our kids can hide as much as they want. They can create ghost accounts. They can do all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, you know, one thing I realized is I'm not nearly as in control as I thought I was, but mm -hmm. what I want to do is, is attempt to be faithful and trust that these principles that we're, that we're putting in place, these values that we're espousing will be shaping for our kids and that they will result in good practices down the road, even though there will be times of deviating away from them throughout the adolescent sure. journey, which is to be expected and understood. For sure. For sure. Uh, what are some examples of healthy and beneficial usage of digital? Yeah, great. Again, I think there's lots of great um, social engagement that can take place on devices. I got to tell you, like uh, when it came to NBA 2K, and now I have two boys, so I cannot speak from the perspective of working with young ladies. I just want to really acknowledge that. And, um, you know, our research does tell us that, that um, uh, issues around social media seem to have a greater negative effect on young ladies than they do on young men. I think part of that is because in many cases, there's a, a relational way of being and way of attacking on social media that has deeper effect on our young ladies at times or on many of them than it does our young men. Most of the kind of the attacks that happen to young men are more physical in nature. And so it's more difficult to engage in those types of attacks in those, on those platforms. So that's just something we seem to see. Um, having said that, um, like, you know, with NBA 2K, my boys have great uh, experiences together as a community. They problem solve together. They function as team. Like, there's lots of great things that I actually celebrate. Now, some people will say to me things like, well, Sid, why, why then do you keep pushing your kids to be involved in, like, um, physical, external activities like basketball teams or sports? And, and the thing that I say about that is I think both activities present all sorts of great life learning moments. The difference is that in a healthy sporting environment, there's a significant trusted adult that can help you interpret and respond to those situations that arise. Whereas in an online platform, oftentimes that adult is not present. And so that's of course concerning in that sense. But I do appreciate some of the social experiences that happen there. I think there's lots of creative opportunities to build, develop and grow. I mean, um, you know, there's, there's, there's many great problem solving video games or experience. Minecraft is a great building space. There's lots of these things that are actually really fun and enjoyable and developmentally helpful in some of these spaces. I love, I mean, I love that I get to travel and I get to FaceTime my boys on a consistent, regular basis. I love that my son can text me. And then sometimes I don't love that my son can text me. It removes him from carrying the responsibility of solving the problem that's been presented to himself and instead looks to dump it off and have me solve it for him. So we actually try to remove some of his opportunities to access help 
so that he has to actually work through solving some of the problems that present themselves as well. So <laughs> there's some interesting tensions that go along with that. I also really do like when I can be helpful. So when my boys were starting to go to movie theaters with their friends, if it was a movie that was inappropriate, they could text me and then I could call them and say, hey, I need to have you home. I'm coming to pick you up in 10 minutes. So we provided ways for them to escape unhealthy environments without putting at risk some of their social capital that they had in those moments. And then other times we thought it was really appropriate for there to be a cost to their beliefs and decisions that they were making. And so we would push them to stand alone in that moment as not stand alone, but process that or own the process themselves. So I think there's lots of, of benefits and, and also costs um, when it comes to the devices and platforms. It's again, it's more than just a tool. Okay. I'm going to acknowledge that there is, you know, the medium is the message to some degree and we should, and what I mean by that is the platform itself carries with it certain values and influences. But having said that, um, there is a redemptive way for us to use many of these platforms and devices. And we should be teaching our kids to be thinking missionally or kingdom minded or thinking about how can this be flourishing for others. That's the type of disposition mm. that we want our kids to move into. Um, mm. You know, one of the things that we just talk a lot in our home is how do we serve others in whatever space or environment we're in? What does it look like for us to be acting for the good of others? And that includes both their um, online uh, space and their offline space. So we would call it hybrid living, living online or offline. How do we do that in a way that reflects God's values or his way of being that he would have for us? Mm -hmm. That's really good. Can you address what to do when your co-parent allows your child to be on a certain social media platform that you wouldn't allow yourself? Boy, you, you know, that is, uh, that is so hard. I, um, so uh, my friends who are single parents are in many ways my heroes, just, you know, single parents where they're having to, to do battle by themselves in their home spaces. And I gotta be honest with you, like, I am really grateful that, that Jen and I are on the same page and we're in it together because there's been many times where I have to tap out and I go, babe, I'm done. I need you to own this or I'm going to have a ministry in prison if I stay in this much longer. Like that's just what's going to happen. Here. And so I'm so thankful that, that Jen could do that. Um, and then I think if I didn't have Jen just had to do it alone, how hard would that be? And then I go, oh, what if my, this other, you know, the significant other was pulling in the opposite direction of the way I want to pull. That's even, that's even more difficult. So I'm deeply sympathetic to that. I don't have an easy answer. I think the best is when both parents or guardians can be on the same page. I think that's important. I think that's where the conversation needs to start and it should be informed. And uh, again, I, I want to be really careful because there's no simplistic answer to that. And mm -hmm. then if that can't happen, um, I think that it's really fair to go in our home. These are the rules in our home. So when you're in this space, this is how we behave. And here's what I'm shooting for. I'm hoping that um, the rules we have are actually an invitation into a more flourishing way. And that by tasting that, that would become most attractive. So even when you're in other spaces, you'll still lean that way because you actually know that that's the best way of being. Which by the way, means that when we place rules and when we put rules in place, we need to be thinking not simply is this right, but how is this good and work hard at helping our kids understand and experience the goodness of the rules that we're putting in place. I think that's really important for us to try to do. Mm, yeah, that's, it's really a very tough question. Absolutely. Talking about screen time and uh, iPad usage, um, how, how would we create, you talked about creating those family values um, and maybe looking over those a bit. How, how would you go about uh, creating a taking time off from iPads every once in a while? Yeah. And then yeah. when you want your kids to get off the iPads, preventing a complete and utter meltdown. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, good luck with that. <laughs> I want to be really clear that there's no guarantee that you're not going to have a massive meltdown. <laughs> but however, we actually get to be the parents. And so, hey, it, you can have your meltdown if you want. That's fine. But this is just how it's going to be here. Now, there's a couple of things I think that, again, are really important. Uh, number one is, um, is, is it's really helpful 
when, when we can model with integrity what we're asking for from our kids or, or explain with integrity why it may be different based upon time, stages of life, et cetera, et cetera. But that integrity is really, really important and really, really helpful. Consistency is really important and really helpful. And when they're, you know, we struggle with that. So we recreate, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third thing is, you know, and there's a great principle when we remove something, what are we filling it with? And I, and I think that there's a response of, you know, I think there's something really helpful when we can offer our kids something better in place of the lesser thing that we're removing. So, mm -hmm. you know, we would do something, uh, uh, again, this is where we found shared experiences and physical activity to be really important in our home. So we invested, this was just us, you know, and not all kids are active. I, I want to just acknowledge that, but um, we, invest, uh, we invested in physical activity. So we bought ski passes. We did that together. We found that if we could get out on the hill and do that together, that was a win. We would hike together. And for the first 15 minutes, our kids hated it. But once we got them moving, the right chemicals started working in their brain and their body, and that became a win. And then the other thing we started to do, because we knew we needed to get out of the home, we needed to get active, is we just invited really fun people in our experiences with us. So our kids loved their older cousin, Kate, who's like a child magnet. And so we would bribe, pay, force Kate to come with us on hikes for activities, <laughs> and our boys would be willing to come. And so we gave them a taste of these good things that really help promote health in them. And then, um, and then the other thing that we did is we just said, hey, like, you may not like this, that's okay. So my identity or sense of being was not tied up in my kid's emotional response to the situation. But again, there needed to be things like fairness, warnings, uh, appropriate other options and reasonableness in what we were doing. But ultimately, I'm the parent, and if you're going to choose to have a meltdown, then that's going to be your choice. But my job as a parent is to make the best decisions I can for what I believe to be best for you, and I'm going to do that. When you're older, you get to make your own decisions. So I would mm -hmm. say that to my boys. I'd say, hey, son, uh, and we had plenty of massive meltdowns in our home. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And, um, and we would just go, hey, kiddo, when you're older, you get to make your own call on that. That's going to mm -hmm. be your deal. But right now in our home, this is the decision that we're making. And sometimes I would say to my boys, I would say, hey, boys, today, this is the boundary I'm putting in place. Um, I have a hard time even telling you why, but I'm making the best decision I can today. And tomorrow might be different. But today, right now, this is the best option that I got. And so that's where we're going to roll. And now, again, um, our kids know when they're loved. Our kids know when they're enjoyed. You know, my kids felt most loved by me when they were enjoyed by me the most. And so I, we fought really hard to find activities that we could do and enjoy together. Mm -hmm. And again, that might be board games. That might be going to a movie. That might be doing something creative. You know, every family is different, but you got to find those things. And then you lean into them and you invest in them um, so that you're continuing to grow good relational capital which can allow you to withstand some of the withdrawals that are going to come your way when you're dealing with some of these other things. Absolutely. Well, we talked a bit about gaming. We talked about the pros of, you know, the socialization, how they're building a relationship and, the, and then also some of the negatives that come with that. And also how key the relationship is that we have with our kid when we notice things, hey, you know, we can come alongside them and actually have a conversation rather than assert a boundary. Is there any, um, you know, is there any evidence or stats or any of that kind of stuff that shows that gaming can change behavior, can change, um, you know, brain and how that, that kind of works or. Yeah. You, you know, that's a great question. I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of research out there right now around um, the development of neurological pathways in terms of some of the addictive behaviors. And it's hard for us to really, you know, I want to be careful here. I'm a youth pastor and a father not a scientist or a medical doctor. Um, but, but there, you know, there is, there, there is some research out there in terms of how um, the reward system in the brain is creating neurological pathways or connections to, to things that make it difficult to disengage from. Now, I think there's some controversy on whether we would call it addiction or simply habit. And um, so, you know, some people would define addiction primarily as a negative physical 
uh, or hurtful response from within if you have to disengage from the element for it to be called an addiction. Otherwise, perhaps it's just a habit. It just means it's hard for us to get away from the practice over and over again. So I think there's something about that that's concerning. I think there's something about, um, you know, the, the how we disengage from from life outside of this screen. We would call it being in the flow, where it's time you know, it stands still. We don't realize how much time has gone by. It's hard for us to disengage. There's a greater emotional connection to what's happening there. And, and, and you know, creators of games and social media platform work really hard to grab us in such a way that it's hard for us to disengage. There is some research on, on the development of the frontal lobe based upon screen engagement, primarily entertainment-based screen mm -hmm. engagement, where we're seeing... Um, the part of the frontal lobe that controls our ability to be aware of others, our ability to engage in long-term um, uh, logical thought processing that seems to be somewhat inhibited by the amount of time that we're spending on screens. The, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests that you know anyone under the age of two, there should be actually no screen time for kids under the age of two. And then, you know, as you start moving older, you're looking at one to two hours of entertainment-based uh, screen engagement being really, you know, about all that you do in many of these cases. And I think there's lots of unknowns there. And then again, when it comes to creative use, when it comes to um, healthy activity, there can be some different effects. But I, I think the science is fairly young, Rachel. So I'm, I'm cautioned, I'm cautious. But what I know is that there are a lot of people out there that are concerned about the effects of the amount of time that, that uh, the effects of how much of, of excessive amount of time spent in our screens mm -hmm. that it has on kids. And then as parents, we just know, mm -hmm. like I would sit down with Peyton and Cole and I would say, hey, Peyton, when you spend this much time on screens, here's what we see from you. Mm -hmm. You are you. You don't <clears throat> listen to your parents as well. You're angry. Mm -hmm. You you don't have life to you. Um, and this is what we observe. Now with Cole, we'd say this is something different. And then we would say, but when you're doing these activities, son, here's what we observe in you. This is what we see. And so I think the eye test is sometimes you know that that's enough mm -hmm. science for me as a parent with my kids, and we talk about that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good to draw it back to. These are the things that I'm noticing about yeah. that change when you use, and that outweighs the science. <laughs> so, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for um, parental controls that people could use to monitor screen time or to monitor? You know, these kind of yeah. things, do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, I think one of the great devices is actually the Disney Circle. So you can get that on mm -hmm. online at Amazon. And the Disney Circle is great because you can monitor each different device and its amount of time and what it's accessing um, within your home. And for us, the reason that we appreciated it was not so much, I mean, we, you can control, you can shut off access for individual mm -hmm. devices or the home to the, to the Wi-Fi. That wasn't our primary. The primary was we started having objective data that could allow for us to have good conversation with our kids. So we would say, hey, how much time do you think you spent on your device? Oh, not very much. I said, oh, well, actually, you've just spent five hours. So you, you know what I mean? And then we could talk about, well, what are you using that time for? Are there other more healthy ways to use that time or what's appropriate? So it allowed us to have a type of control, especially when our kids were younger, but it also allowed us to have educated conversations, which I think were really important. Now, um, my son came to me and he was about 12, 13, I think, when we got the Disney device. He said, just so you know, dad, I know how to circumvent the controls on the Disney circle already. And I'm like, yeah, I know you do. Like, huh. I get, they can access, you know, they're smart. They can access yeah. what they want to really early on. Um, the point was, hey, kiddo, you know, I want to give you opportunities to be safeguarded. If you'll take them, invite you into that. And then also we can have the conversations. And then also this says something about what we value most. Now, um, I'll be really honest, Rachel, we didn't use a lot of, filters or mm -hmm. controls in our home. We did the Disney circle for a time. It was helpful. We talked a lot about these things. We have mostly leaned into relationship, conversation, and modeling. Mm -hmm. um, though that became our primary tools of quote unquote protection within our home. But I think accountability software, filtering, um, restrictions can all be helpful as well. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that's great. Are there any social media apps that you would say are the worst for teens to have? Oh, uh, yeah. Now, you know, just to be clear, they're, they're changing and moving so fast that, <laughs> right. that it's, hard, it's really hard to keep up. You know what I mean? Anything can be used for really negative purposes. Some seem to be leaning that way. I mean, I remember when Snapchat first came out, it, it actually was designed as a sexting type of an app where you could show inappropriate mm -hmm. pictures and then there would be, they would be gone. So there would be this false sense of safety that went along with the experience. And then when they realized that families were onto it, they rebranded as more of a storytelling friendship engagement experience. And so, it, you know, it could be used in sexually inappropriate ways, but that actually didn't become the branding and wasn't the primary way of using. But again, that doesn't mean that it's not, um, that it's not dangerous or inappropriate. I think, um, what would I say to that? Like, um, again, there's some really fun things that happen with TikTok, but TikTok is designed to grab your attention and keep your attention over a long period of time. So again, my concern, my concern is a lot about content and what they're being exposed to. But my concern is about what it's doing with their time, their attention, um, what it's keeping them from as much as what it's exposing them to. So um, you've heard me kind of circumvent the question because a lot of these apps can be used for really redemptive purposes, mm -hmm. but a lot of them can be used in really unredemptive ways as well. Again, I think it's helpful. Uh, I mean, we didn't give our kids a, uh, access to a smartphone until grade nine. Uh, that was where we placed it at. But again, I'm really cautious about giving a hard and fast rule there for everyone, because I think it depends on your kid, mm -hmm. their, where their identity has been rooted, how they're experiencing life, their relational context. I mean, even now, like my son, Cole, who's 16, came to me the other day. He said, dad, I want a flip phone. I'm like, why the heck do you want a flip phone? Um, uh, he goes, well, I think I'm just so distracted by my my social media apps on my smartphone. And then I said to him, son, are you struggling with pornography? And we had that conversation. He said, no, that's actually not at all. Because many people will move to a flip phone as a way of trying to deal with the issue of pornography access on a smartphone. That wasn't his issue. But he had just come to the conclusion that it had become an unhealthy distraction in his life. So he made the change. I was mm -hmm. like, wow, that's amazing. And so it was fun to have that conversation. And so we find ourselves going back and forth. And I think, again, the point I want to make is many of these um, apps you can have really helpful uses and many are really unhelpful. And then again, it depends at your stage of development as a young person and who the individual young people are. Um, uh, Common Sense Media does a great job on, on giving parents information around helpful and unhelpful devices and content. And the same goes with Plugged In. Uh, PluggedIn.com, I believe it is, or .org. Those are, those are really helpful websites to give you insight into what are some of the um, platforms or apps or content that kids are engaging mm -hmm. in. That was going to be my next question. What kind of resources would you recommend to parents or the things that we should be reading or catching up on? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think those two are really helpful. There's another great book I would recommend, especially for parents of older teens, two books for uh, maybe three <laughs> uh, for parents <laughs> who are older. There's one called I'm Breaking Up With My, I, I, I'm Breaking Up With My iPhone. I think it's a great book. It's a balanced read. It's not just about abstinence or isolationism, but about actually like being able to become aware of some of the response sequences that you formed in your brain and how you respond to your devices and the things on them and how you break those sequences and move towards a healthy way of relating to your devices. I think that phone's great. Uh, 12 Ways Your Smartphone is Changing You is another yeah. great book. I think it's great for your teenager to read. Um, um, uh, tech proofing, uh, what's it called? I think it's called tech proofing your home. Um, uh, let me just call it up. Actually, it's another really helpful book by Andy Crouch. I'm going to give you the name of that book right now. Give me one second here. And one of the things that he talks about um, when it comes to having a healthy relationship with your technology is that, you know, in your home, uh, it's called the TechWise family story, the TechWise family, everyday steps for putting technology in its proper place. I think that's a great book for parents. And they talk about how making the most important spaces in your home, the most creative spaces in your home or the most character building spaces. So how do we, how do we proliferate those places with activities or things mm -hmm. that can help stimulate and develop good character and creative development in your children? 
I think that's a great book to read. Oh, that's great. Maybe, maybe I have time for a couple more questions. I know that uh, people have busy evenings, got kids going every which way. Um, so I think actually I might have almost asked all of my questions. And I think you addressed a lot of them. A lot of them are, um, you know, I'm stuck to my cell phone. So how on earth can I get my kids to get off their <laughs> cell phone? Is it unfair of me to have that expectation on me if I'm going to be on my cell phone? What would you do in a situation like that? Yeah, I'd say it's going to be hard. I mean, I think it's, I think it's really appropriate to be honest. Now, again, different stages of life, we have different uses of our devices. So I think it's important to sometimes talk about the way we're using our devices and compare those. You know what I mean? I think that's really important. Um, I think it's a great practice um, to ask, you know, to do with your kids, to ask yourselves, okay, um, uh, what, why am I, why, how am I using my devices? How much time am I spending on my devices? How does my use make me feel? Um, what are things that are healthy about the way I'm using my device and what are things that are unhealthy? And excuse me, for us to be able to track those say over a few days and then have that conversation together as a family. I think that can be a really great experience together in learning discernment and doing good self-assessment. And by the way, the skill of self-awareness and self-assessment can allow for self-correction. And that's a really important skill for us to be able to pass on to our kids so that they can move towards healthy ways of living, not just now, but in years to come as well. So we model that together. And I think that's a great thing for us to do. All right, Sid. I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's been fabulous, honestly. I've taken, whole, I've taken a lot of notes on my paper here. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a lot of takeaways. Uh, just building the the need to keep fostering and building that connection relationship with your kids so that you can come alongside them and, and disciple them in the way that you want to see them go rather than coming out with all these strict rules. And it's not even about the rules. I mean, it is. But the conversation and creating that conversation with them. So thank you so much for um, engaging with us and... Uh, we really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Totally my pleasure. And I just, I got to say, by tomorrow, I might say, oh man, all that stuff didn't work at all. We're <laughs> back in it again. So we're wrestling on this, uh, through this stuff on a day-to-day, -day, at a day-to-day -day level. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. I'm glad that you guys could be here. Um, and we'll hope to see you next week. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.